Well, I am uh, so grateful to be with you. My friend Elise Fitzpatrick was with you last week, and I'm, I'm wondering how you've done uh, giving grace to your children this week. Yeah, did you think about that a few times when you started to say that same old thing and started to rethink that a little bit? Uh, don't we want to be great moms, grace-filled moms that our kids will remember? And tonight, what I want to talk to you about, I think something that you also want to be is a great friend. And when we have people we love around us going through something incredibly difficult, we want to be there for them. And we want to figure out how to help them. We want to encourage them. We want, sometimes we want to fix them. But mostly we want to do and be a person who really helps them move out of that uh, terrible and dark place where they are. And so I hope you'll allow with me to share with you a few thoughts on how we can be the kind of godly friends to the people that we're in communi community with in a way that actually helps them when they're hurting deeply rather than add to their hurt. Uh, this became very significant to me a number of years ago when I gave birth to a daughter that we named Hope. And when Hope was born, uh, she had club feet, and uh, the OBGYN, when he delivered her and saw those club feet, he said, first thing, well, don't worry about that, because we can put casts on her feet, and, and she'll be fine. But you are going to want to have the pediatrician take a good look at her when he gets here. And that night, he came to my room, and he had a little sheet of paper on which he'd made a list of what he called a number of little things wrong with Hope. Uh, in addition to the club feet, she had a real large, soft spot and she had kind of a flat chin and extra skin on her neck. And she was very lethargic. She didn't move much, didn't cry much, wasn't holding her temperature. And he said, you know, a lot of times when you see a number of little things wrong, they actually add up to something more significant. And so I want to have a geneticist from Vanderbilt Hospital come and examine her tomorrow. So the next day, that doctor came, and he came to my room that night. and. He told us that he suspected Hope had a rare metabolic disorder called Zellweger syndrome. Now, I had never heard of that, and you probably haven't either. What it meant was that Hope was missing a tiny subcellular particle that you and I have in every cell of our bodies called peroxisomes. And the best way I know how to explain it is those peroxisomes are kind of like the cell's trash man. And they have one kind of trash they're responsible to take out of our cells, long-chain fatty acids. And so he explained to us that night that the problem in Hope's body was that in her cells, basically, there were no peroxisomes, so there was nobody to take out the trash. And so those long-chain fatty acids would build up in all of her cells and all of her systems and become toxic. And he told us, in fact, that a lot of damage had already been done to all of our major organs especially her liver and her kidneys and her brain. And he told us that there was no treatment and no cure and that most children with that syndrome live less than six months. And he left us with a sheet of paper that had, in very medical terms, all the things that were likely wrong in Hope's body and all the things that would go wrong in Hope's body and pictures, post-mortem pictures of babies with this syndrome, and he left, and that's when I just sensed my world cave in a way. <laughs> my dream began to die. I had so long to have a daughter. <laughs> had a son, Matt, who was eight at the time, and I looked forward to having a daughter who would uh, look like me and talk like me and grow old with me and be my friend. And so even that night, I began to let go of that dream. And uh, Hope was with us for 199 days. And those days were packed with doing everything we could to pack a lifetime of memories into the number of days that he gave us with her. Um, I'd be lying if I didn't also say those days had a fair share of fear and a fair share of sorrow. But so often I would think to myself, okay, I can't let myself get too sad now because I've got my whole life for that. And if I let myself really give way to my grief now, I'll miss her life. 
And if I miss her life, I'll regret that the rest of my life. And uh, so then came that night when we said goodbye. And, you know, I, I had tried to convince myself that since I knew it was coming and I had these six months of her life to prepare for it, that perhaps somehow the grief wouldn't be as bad for me as it might be for someone else after her death, that I'd somehow get a head start on it. Um, but it just didn't seem to work that way. And at first, after she died, I felt um, like I had learned so much. I felt wise and enriched by her life and had things I wanted to say. And then as a little bit of time went on, I didn't feel rich anymore. I felt empty, and I didn't feel like I had things to say. I felt like I had a lot of questions. And I just felt sad, so overwhelmingly sad. Now, to have a child with that syndrome means that my husband and I must both be carriers of the recessive gene trait for that syndrome. Now, can you remember back to your high school biology class when you had that one week on genetics and what that means? So what that meant, since David and I are both carriers of the recessive gene trait, is that whenever we have a child, that child would have a 25% chance of having the fatal syndrome. So we didn't know we were carriers of that when we had our son, Matt, who's now 23. But then after we had hope, then we knew. And so that meant we had a really difficult decision to make about whether or not we would have more children. And maybe that seems like a real obvious choice to you, one way or the other. It wasn't to us. For one thing, when I tell you about hope, I... I think perhaps you can imagine some of the pain and sorrow of it. It's probably harder for you to imagine the joy of having her. And there was some, you know, there, life in itself is valuable and brings joy. And she brought so much joy and richness into our lives. And, you know, she, she changed everything about our lives in that sense of really learning what it means to live one day at a time really growing in our understanding of the value of life, what makes a life valuable, which is not what a person can contribute. It's not the length of life, the quality of life. It's just life itself in the image of God. And so as we considered that, we just felt like we wouldn't automatically say no to the possibility of going through that again because we loved hope. But of course, our lives aren't just us. And... There was our son, Matt, and, you know, Matt lived in a house whole six months waiting for a sibling to die. That had to be weird and hard. Probably even harder was living a lot longer than that with a really sad mom. I promise you that couldn't have been much fun. And then besides Matt, there was our parents. And as hard as it is to lose a child, I think perhaps it's doubly difficult as a parent to watch your child lose a child. And it had just been just devastating to my parents and to David's parents. And so we made the decision to take surgical steps to prevent another pregnancy. Now, sometimes I tell this story with my husband, David, and I, one time I was, say, I, I was at a church and I said that. I said, we took surgical steps to prevent another pregnancy. And he leaned into the microphone and he said, we? <laughs> You're getting a feel for my husband, right? I mean, do they not want a lot of credit for this? Yeah. Well, evidently it didn't work. And I discovered a year and a half after Hope died that I was pregnant. And I got to tell you, my heart began to pound. And I drove down to David's office and I told him, and we sat there shaking our heads in a sense, you know, like, how did this happen? Although we do kind of understand the basics. <laughs> but, you know, um, we thought about how we both at times had regretted that vasectomy decision but would come back around to feeling like we had made the wise choice. We thought about how that geneticist had told us when we had hope, now don't take any permanent birth control steps because we can test, do prenatal testing very early. And you understand what he was saying. 
But at that point, we were very grateful to know that there was prenatal testing because we felt like it would be really helpful to know on this journey which, which direction we were headed. And to, especially before we shared it with our son, with our family, to be able to give them the whole picture if we were anticipating a healthy child or another child with Zellweger syndrome. And so I went through that prenatal testing and we discovered that this time I would have a son. Our son's name was Gabriel and he was also born with the fatal syndrome with Zellweger. And um, he was such a joy to us. He was so beautiful and so easy to love. And he was with us for 183 days and then we said goodbye to him. And once again, I was plunged into to deep sorrow. So I want to talk a little bit about tonight, about what it means to be a good friend to someone who is going through deep sorrow, what it means to be a church that is a safe place for sad people. Now, when I say safe, I don't necessarily mean that the hurting person never ends up getting hurt a little bit more because... Let's face it, I mean, when we've gone through something incredibly difficult, we become kind of sensitive, kind of like when we have a burn somewhere on our body and we rub up against things and we didn't realize how sensitive we were in that area, but when it gets touched, we, we realize. And similarly, when our hearts are raw with pain and we rub up against people, sometimes it, even if they don't intend to be hurtful, it just hurts. So we can't always expect that the person who is hurting that will never add to it all, but wouldn't that be our desire to certainly uh, learn, figure out how to express grace and love and comfort to those people around us as best as we can? So I want to offer as quickly as I can six things, six characteristics, I think, of a church that's a safe place for sad people. And the first one is this, that a church that is a safe place for sad people overcomes the awkwardness to engage. I sometimes think about all those poor people that surrounded me and David. I mean, what do you say to a mom when her child is dying and it's not going to get better? And the truth is I had such high expectations for people. I have to admit to you that the first time around I set really high hurdles for people to jump over to make their way in my direction. And I ended up very disappointed at times with people. Uh, it, it wasn't until later, until actually till after Hope's death, and I was standing in the line to greet a couple whose child who had died. Here I was. Hope had been gone for about two months. I, of all people, should know what to say, and I had no idea what to say to them. And that's, I think, the first time I felt grace for all those people who struggled to know what to say to me. But, you know, sometimes, if, have you been like that? Like you, you see someone across the church and you know that someone they love has died or you know that their spouse has had an affair or that there's been some terrible failure or job loss or some difficult diagnosis and you think to yourself, I should say something, but you don't know what to say and you really don't want to be that person that she walks up to somebody else and says, you can't believe what she said to me, Right? And so oftentimes it's easier to just go the other way, to just say nothing. And I want to encourage you to overcome the awkwardness to engage. And I want to encourage you that actually you don't need something brilliant to say. You don't have to be inspiring. You don't have to have a great piece of advice or expertise what you really don't have and what I suggest you try real hard not to give is the story of somebody else you know who has had that same experience. You know, I think there's something about us. We want these people to know that we're kind of, walk, we, we understand what's going on, on with them. And so something clicks in our heads. It's like we scan, like a computer scan our memory for some kind of connection. And then that's what flows out of us when we talk to someone. You know, I knew someone who had this same illness, or I know someone who went through this, and we tell them the story. And I just got to tell you, somebody on the other side of a lot of those stories, it's just generally not helpful. So when your computer scans and finds that, you know, just let, kind of let that one go, okay? Because it's probably not helpful. Um, oftentimes, do you know what the best thing is to say? You can say, I don't know what to say. 
You know, that's really enough. In fact, it's, I kind of think when people said that to me, there was a sense in which they were humble before the magnitude of my loss and didn't presume that I expected them to fix it, that I expected them to have some word from the scripture I hadn't thought of or to tell me about some expert or to offer a book or to tell me about a diet or, you know, all those things that we, we want to be helpful, we want to have advice and you know what, it's just a great thing to say, I don't know what to say. It's a great thing to, when people would just come alongside me and sometimes just take my hand and squeeze it. Sometimes I saw tears in their eyes. And let me tell you, when I saw someone else shedding tears, it was like, you know, here I was carrying these bucket loads of sorrow. It was almost as if someone took one of the buckets to carry it for me. It meant everything. They didn't have to have all the right words to say. So don't worry about having the right thing to say. Just overcome the awkwardness to engage. You know, I think I always thought before I, that, that there were certain people, if, like I, I didn't feel like if I wasn't in their close circle of friends, I would think, well, they've got plenty of friends around them who are saying something to us, so like, they like won't really notice if I don't say anything. Let me just tell you from the other side of this, you know everybody, whether or not they have overcome the hurdle to say something to you, even, the, even if it's just, I'm so sad with you, or I'm so sorry you're going through this. Just the very minimum, that just like knocks down the hurdle between you and every, every person. And I, I remember what really humbled me after Hope's death was when I saw this girl at church that, whose father had died, and I had never said anything to her because a little bit, of, I bought a card that I intended to send, and it sat on my dresser for the longest time. And then after a while, I felt so embarrassed it had been so long. I see heads shaking. You've done this too, right? I thought, it's been so long, I'm kind of embarrassed. And so I just won't send anything. And, you know, so many people have said something to her that, that she won't notice that I never really said anything. And, you know, that, that humbled me. It gave me grace for all those people who must have felt the same way about me. And so it helped me to begin to give grace to other people who felt so awkward and made some of those assumptions, realizing that they, they hadn't been there and why would I expect them to know exactly what to do, what to say. So overcome the awkwardness to engage. Secondly, a church that is a safe place for sad people makes room for tears and sadness. You know, I just had so many tears that needed to come out. I was a big ball of pain inside I remember a week after Hope died going to the uh, department store, to the cosmetics counter, and I was buying some mascara, and I said to the girl, will this mascara run when I cry? And she laughed, and she said, no. She goes, are you going to be crying? And I said, yes, I am. I just had a lot of tears that needed to come out, and sometimes I think I'm still not done with that. I went to a church uh, choir retreat about three months after Hope died. I just remember getting up and saying to the, my friends in the choir, I just said, you know, I, I just need you to give me some time and space to be sad. And don't assume that I've lost my faith or that I'm dipping into anger or depression. I lost someone I loved. And I just need some time and space to be sad. Would you give people some time and space to be sad? Not work so hard to fix them so fast. You know, we, wanna, we want to help our friends. It pains us when we see our friends hurting. It's not a bad instinct to want to fix because it pains us when we see them hurting. But understand that tears don't reflect the lack of faith. Tears, I think, are a tool a gift that God gives us to wash over, to wash away all of that deep pain that we feel inside. So don't rush us through our tears. Let us be sad. And along with this, that, though, a really great friend in the midst of grief is someone that I could also laugh with. i got to tell you, it's really awkward to laugh in front of people when you're going through grief because you have this great fear. You think, well, if I laugh, out loud and people see me, I'm afraid that number one, either they'll think I'm over it or number two, 
which would be far worse, they'll think I didn't really love hope. So let me tell you, a really great friend is someone who allows you to cry without shushing away your tears, shares your tears with you, but is also willing to laugh with you without assuming that you're necessarily fi all fixed now, all better now, or that you didn't really love the person that you lost. Are you a safe friend that you could both laugh and cry? The third one I want to spend a little bit more time with, and it's a little bit more challenging. I'm going to challenge you to think with me a little bit more deeply, and this is a church that is a safe place for sad people goes deeper than deliverance in prayer. I don't know if your church is like my church, but, you know, there's a prayer list that goes around, and usually the prayer list asks for, for the person who's sick to be healed and for there to be, you know, relief from the difficulty and restoration of the relationship. I mean, we're just... We're pretty much oriented that way, right? That we, we pray for God to do something, and especially in regard to those things, to heal. And you know what? It's not bad to ask him to do those because he is our resource. He's our father. He welcomes us. He longs for us to come with our needs and desires and place them before us. But the thing is, we just don't want to limit our prayers, to only those things. We don't want to demand those things. We want to broaden our vac vocabulary for how we pray about these kind of situations and needs out of recognition of what the scriptures tell us. And see, the scriptures don't promise us that there will always be a fix for every failure or a healing in this life for every illness. What the scriptures actually present us all kinds of purposes for which God intends to use the suffering in this life for his good purposes. And if that's the case, wouldn't we want to expand our prayers from solely asking God for a miracle to remove the suffering and ask him, beg him, that if he chooses not to remove it, would he redeem it? Would he actually accomplish in our lives those good things that he has told us in the scripture that he intends to use the suffering in our lives? So I'm going to work as quickly as I can through a list of scriptures that present to us some reasons. You know, the question we all have when we suffer is why? And actually, here are some scriptures that have an answer to the question. Maybe it's not always the answer we want that we're looking for, but I want to impress them upon you. These are the answers that the scripture provides. Would you take them and consider them and grab hold of them and then ask God to accomplish these purposes as you pray with those who are going through great difficulty. The first one, you can, you can open your Bibles and work your way through me. I'm kind of going in order, in biblical order, or if you just want to listen to me read them, that's fine too, okay? The first one is in John 9, 3. Do you remember that story where there's the man who is born blind and Jesus heals him? And the disciples come up to Jesus and they say to Jesus, they have an assumption. See if you can hear what their assumption is. They say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They think they know the answer to why, which is God's punishing somebody for sin. They just don't know who. And Jesus' answer in John 9, 3 is, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in his life. So one thing that we, one way God intends to use our suffering is he wants to put his glory or the way he works in people's lives on display. So what difference, if that is a purpose for which God uses suffering, as we want to go deeper than only praying for deliverance in prayer, how about when we get on our knees with that friend, we say, God, would your glory be put on display in my friend's suffering? Would, you, would your work on her and in her and through her be put on display for the world to see in her suffering? John 15, 2, Jesus says that every branch that does, not, that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Now, I'm no horticulture expert, and you can just come look at all the dead plants in my house. But I do understand a little bit about this pruning. 
is uh, it's clipped back for the very purpose it would be more fruitful, right? You know, sometimes God allows our lives to get clipped back. And that pruning hurts. It's never comfortable. <laughs> we think he's doing something harsh, but you see, he's the master gardener. He knows just where to prune, just how much to prune. And his pruning is always purposeful. And here is the purpose, to make us more fruitful. What kind of fruit does he want to develop? Does he want to come flowing out of your life? Some of you know, right? Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit, that as he prunes you, that out of your life would come this abundant fruit of the Holy Spirit, of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. In Romans 8, 28, this is one of those verses that those of us who go through something hard, oh, how we hate to have this verse quoted at us, don't we? Well, you know that God works all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. You know, we don't like to have it quoted at us, but oh, how grateful I am that it's in the Bible. How grateful I am that that's the truth. That we serve a God who is so sovereign. In his sovereignty, he can cause the worst things we can imagine to work together for our good because we belong to him. What a great promise. Now, sometimes we don't actually see what the good is that he is causing all things to work together toward, that is in the next verse in Romans 8, 29, which he says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, God wants to use the difficulties in your life to shape you into the likeness of Christ. He wants to develop you into a woman who thinks and acts and looks like Christ. And he's willing to use difficulty in your life so that you might look more like Christ. So would you be willing to pray in your own difficulty with a friend? Say, Lord, would you use this difficulty to conform us into your image? 2 Corinthians 1.3. This is one we're a little more familiar with that we grab hold of. And, and that is that we... that. Um, he comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So he wants to use our suffering to equip us to comfort others. I wonder if there are some of you who would say that is exactly what he's done in my life. Who would have known he was going to use that hard thing? But then when it happened to someone else, I was prepared. I could draw alongside that person as someone who understands. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 is this, Paul's telling this story about being in a storm on the ship and he says that we despaired of life itself. In fact, we, we, we felt we had received the sentence of death and then he knows why this difficulty has happened. He says, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves but on God who raises from who raises the dead. Now, you know, this goes completely against our modern American ethos of how we think life works. Because you see, you and I value independence. We like to be those women on the commercial who can, you know, our strong woman, let me roar. I can take care of myself because we value independence. But you see, God values dependence. Paul is able to see in his difficulty here that it caused him not to rely on ourselves but on God. You know, would you be willing to pray with your friends? Say, Lord, would you use the neediness that we feel right now to cause us to develop more of a way of life of depending on you instead of being independent from you? Because that's what, this is why you tell us to pray, give us this day our daily bread so we'll come back again tomorrow. Because you long for us to see you as our source and to be dependent upon you. 
uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 10 and 11, to make the life of Jesus evident, Paul says that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. When you've gone through a hard thing, do you think people around you would say, you know what? The way that you have gone through this suffering is, is, is different than most people. I see most people that are filled with self-pity and so many people who are, are filled with despair. And I know you're honest about being afraid and yet there's, there's something that's different. I see a peace in you and I see a joy in you despite your sorrow and peace in spite of the chaos. And there's something different. Don't, wouldn't we want to pray for each other that Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, would be manifested, made known, made evident in our lives in the midst of difficulty? In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul speaks about the suffering in his own life, this mysterious thorn, remember that? And evidently, Paul seems to understand why this has happened, which is interesting. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7... He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. What's he talking about? Well, what he's talking about, you see, Paul had been given a personal guided tour of heaven. And he recognizes that this is the kind of spiritual experience, spiritual credential that could actually puff him up with pride. You know, the kind of thing when he's sitting around a table and everybody's kind of bragging about how spiritual they are, he can throw this one down and it tops everybody on the table. Well, you know, I was given a tour of heaven, right? (laughs) And evidently he recognizes his weakness in the area of spiritual pride. And so he sees in this thorn, in this painful thorn, he actually sees it as God's provision that would protect him from something even more painful, which would be using this incredible gift from God to make himself look good instead of make God look good. So he sees this in this purpose. This is to keep us from sin. So perhaps when we want to go deeper than deliverance in prayer, we would say, Lord, would you use this in my life? I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know necessarily right now what the sin is, but use it to keep me from sin. Keep me from sin in my walk on this journey of walking through this sorrow. In that same passage, though, he he begs for the Lord to take the thorn away, and then he hears Jesus himself speak to him. But I, I think when he heard Jesus speak, it wasn't what he was hoping to hear. Because instead of hearing Jesus say he was going to give him the healing he hoped for, Jesus said he was going to give him more of himself. He said, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so we see that in the midst of some of the worst things we can imagine, we get to experience that Christ can really be enough for us. You know, you and I don't want to have to experience that Christ is enough for us. We don't want the things and the people we love to be taken away from us. And I know there are so many of you in this room that your lives are marked with, there's an empty place. There's an empty place in your heart. Maybe an empty bedroom at your house. Maybe you sleep in an empty bed. Maybe your bank account has been emptied out. Maybe as you look at the future or your schedule, what you see is emptiness. And you see this as your greatest problem. And I want you to know tonight that God does not see this as your greatest problem. He sees it as his greatest opportunity. That he might fill up the empty place in your life with himself. That you would actually experience that his grace is sufficient. That it's enough. That he will give you the grace that you need in the form and in the timing and in the quantity in which you need it. So would you pray in your own struggles or with your friend? Would you say, Lord, 
Would you show us that you're enough? Give us that sufficient grace you have promised to give. Let it be enough for us. Philippians 3.10, Paul says that he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You know, a lot of us as women, I wonder how many of you, you would say that at some point along the way, you have said, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you, Lord. And yet here is Jesus. The prophet Isaiah tells us that he is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. How do we think we're ever going to really know Christ and share in fellowship with him if we never have sorrows? Can you see that when you are experiencing deep sorrow, that's when you have the opportunity to share in fellowship with the man of sorrows like no other time in your life? You know, we discover when we're hurting that it really helps to find someone who's been through what we're going through. We discover pretty quick who the safe people are to draw close to in the midst of our sorrow. And I want to suggest to you that Jesus, because he is a man of sorrows, is a safe person to draw close to in your sorrows because he understands. He has known deep sorrow. He said he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Would you draw close to him, experiencing a fellowship with Christ perhaps you've never experienced before? Would you pray for that for your friend and for yourself? Hebrews 12 says that God disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. And that for the moment, all discipline seems painful. That's like an understatement, don't you think? Okay. Rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So let's begin to pray in our suffering, Lord, I don't want this suffering to be wasted in my life. I don't want to go through this and not learn from it, not be shaped by it in exactly the, what you want me to learn, to shape me in exactly the way you want to shape me. So, Lord, I welcome you to do your disciplining work. Rub off the rough edges in my life through this sorrow and struggle so that I will be, so I can share in your holiness. How about James 1, 2 through 4, where he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And can we just stop right there and say, this is otherworldly, right? Okay. <laughs> For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you want to grow up in God or do you just want a static experience of coming to know Christ and yet never having your roots go deeper and becoming a woman who can withstand the difficulties of life because you have such a rock solid foundation underneath you in your connectedness to Christ? Do you want to become spiritually mature? Well, God's chosen method, I'm sorry to tell you this, God's chosen method, see, I have a chosen method for becoming mature. It's like come to a women's event and take really good notes. That would be my chosen method. How about you? <laughs> Evidently, God's chosen method is that he would allow suffering into our lives and that we would persevere through it and discover him in the midst of it and that we would become mature women who know him. And then finally in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, Peter writes, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, that you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, so that your faith may be found genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, some of you, you're surrounded by people who know you are a Christian. And, you know, the truth is, if you can give some good lip service to God about him being good and how good it is to have him in your life when things are going good in your life, really, who cares? But you know what? 
when the worst thing you can imagine happens and they see that you are determined to trust him with it even though you're struggling and that his praise is on your lips and that you're experiencing him like never before, that's when faith is proved genuine. It's like the curtain is pulled back on your life in the midst of suffering and people can see into the genuineness of your faith. Is your faith being proved genuine in the midst of your suffering? Would you pray in the midst of your suffering or as you get on your knees with your friend who is struggling or as you work your way through the prayer list from church and ask God to do a work in that person's life that their faith might be proved genuine? You know, to go deeper than deliverance in prayer means that we approach prayer not as a tool to manipulate God to get what we want, but as a way to draw close to God and to welcome what he wants in our lives, trusting that he will do what is good and right because that's who he is. Number four, a church that is a safe place for sad people gently challenges spiritualism and sentimentalism with scriptural truth. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? Can you guess what I'm getting at there? I mean, isn't it our experience that, especially when we're dealing with death, man, people say some weird things, right? And have some weird ideas and they say things that are so sentimental and we, we think, is that really true? It's nice thing to say, you know, let me tell you, when, when you lose a baby, what people begin to say a lot is they say, well, now she's an angel and she's looking over you. you know? We don't become angels when we die. You know, God created humans and he created the angelic order, but humans don't become angels and babies don't become angels when they die. I have a friend whose mother died in a car accident and I went over to her house when she got home from the funeral and she had a question. She wanted to ask me. She said, she said, you know, when I was standing there at the funeral, all these people were walking through and they would say to me, you know, your mother isn't gone. She's just right here beside you. She's right here with us. And she said, is that true? And we say those kind of things a lot, right? You know, their spirit is here or whatever. And so... I opened up the scriptures and I said, I said, you know, honestly, there's so much we don't know about what it means to be with Christ. But I began to work through what we do know, including that when we are away from the body, we are where? At home with the Lord, right? right? So there's no spirits hanging around here. We're at home with the Lord. So anyway, I'm starting into that. And just then her neighbor came in the door and her neighbor actually physic came over and physically stopped me from talking because, you see, she had something that she felt was far more reliable than the scriptures, and that was her story of a supernatural experience. And that's our culture, my friends. And the truth is, so many of us long for a supernatural experience, to have that sense that God is supernaturally assuring us that our loved one is with him. And so many people long for and uh, look for and then offer their own interpretation of a supernatural experience. And my friends, I want you, as you face the difficulties in your life and as you walk with those who are going through difficulties, to, to depend on something far more solid, far more reliable than someone's interpretation of their supernatural experience, even if you read about it in a best-selling book, okay? And that is, would you depend on what the scriptures say? Would you be that friend, rather than swapping supernatural stories, would you be that friend who's willing to open up the scriptures with your friend who is suffering and say, let's, let's figure out together what God has to say about this. Let's figure out together what we can really depend on is true from the scriptures. The fifth thing I want to encourage you about, well, let me tell you one more thing about that in terms of the, 
when we when we're we go to the scriptures I, I, when we're suffering sometimes what we discover is that God isn't who we thought he was at all I don't know if you've had that experience in suffering but you know sometimes we we, we have in mind who we think God is and then when that really hard thing happens that gets shaken I mean, do you ever hear people say, well, the God I believe in would never, then they finish the blank, right? Well, maybe that God you believe in isn't the God of the Bible. And i got to tell you that suffering gives us the opportunity. It invites us to test and see if this God that we have in our mind is the real God of the Scriptures. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata says something I appreciate. She says that most of us are content to swim around in the shallow end of the things of God until the hard things happen, and then we get pushed into the deep end. So I want to invite you into the deep end in the midst of your suffering. And I want to read to you a quote that I found written by a man. It was actually uh, written by a, a man who had experienced this kind of loss, the loss of a child. And it's a hundred-year-old quote, so you might think, oh, it sounds so antiquated. But I have to tell you, when I read this quote, I thought, this is me. This is my experience. That, that recognition that so many of the things I had thought and taken hold of about God weren't quite right. And that in the midst of my suffering, it gave me the opportunity to refine my understanding of who I, God is. So stick with me through this quote because I think it's worth it, okay? And see if you think you can relate to this. Here's what Abraham Kuyper says in his book, Near Unto God. At first, what our heart feels is that we cannot square this with our God as we imagined him, as we had dreamed him to be. The God we had, we lose. And then it costs so much bitter conflict of soul before refined and purified in our knowledge of God, we grasp another and now the only true God in the place thereof. We fancy ourselves the main object at stake. It is our happiness, our honor, our future, and little God added in. And according to our idea, we are the center of things. And God is there to make us happy. The Father, for the sake of the child. And God's confessed almightiness is solely and alone to serve our interests. And while this is an idea of God which is false through and through it turns the order around and taken in its real sense it makes self god and god our servant so cast down by your sorrow and grief you become suddenly aware that this great god does not measure nor direct the course of things according to your desire that in his plan there are other motives that operate entirely outside of your preferences then you must submit, you must bend, and for the first time you feel what it is to confront the living God, and now you know him, and then begins the new endeavor of the soul to learn to understand this real God. Would you be a real friend with someone going through something hurting? Lots of people can do practical things. Would you be that friend perhaps? who joins in with your friend for the struggle to discover the real God and leave behind all the false notions of the God that we thought we could manipulate and order around. Hmm? All right, number five, a church that's a safe place for sad people anticipates the family pressure points. And by that, I mean both the church family and their immediate family. Can I be honest and say that church was a really hard place for me to go after Hope died? I mean... I, I, I dreaded church for two things. First of all, I thought I, I, I would go and everybody would say something to me about hope. And that would be hard. And at the same time, as I, I was afraid I would go and that nobody would say anything to me about hope. And that would be hard. So it was all just hard. You know, it was also hard because there had been all those women that I was pregnant with. And they still had their children and I didn't. And I knew they felt awkward around me and... I felt awkward around them, and boy, one Sunday it came to a head. I walked out of one building to go back into the sanctuary to get my Bible, and all these women walked out of the nursery building in between with babies in their arms, and they were walking my direction. I'm like by myself. It's like 
gunfight at the OK Corral or something. I don't know, you know. And I was walking toward him, and I'm not sure who wanted to run more, me or them. But I just remember thinking, you know what? I don't want it forever to be awkward around these people. And I want to enjoy their children. As the years go forward, I want their children to remind me, to make me, to be a, a, a joyful reminder of what hope and what Gabe would be like at their age. And I realized, even though it's not very fair, that it was really up to me to take the first step in normalizing my interactions with those other women. And so as they walked toward me, I stopped with the first one, my friend Debbie, whose daughter Joy was born eight days before Hope. And I stroked her hair and I talked to her as everybody else walked by and observed. And, and then I went to my car and cried. <laughs> You know, it was my opportunity to begin to normalize things. You know, I think what happens oftentimes in the church when somebody goes through something hard is, is oftentimes we fall into one of two different ditches. There's one ditch we fall in where we um, hide and withdraw. And, you know, hiding, withdrawing for a little while is okay, but not forever. We want to get back into connectedness with other people but I think another ditch we sometimes fall in is that especially I think this is the case when it's a long illness we fall into this ditch of we get so um, used to it always being all about us you know every prayer list has us and every time we walk into church everybody's always asking us about the latest update or whatever and so it begins to be all about us and we get kind of addicted to the spotlight that it's always about us and you know, some of us, when we're hurting in the church, we need someone around us to kind of help us pull, a, pull us out of whichever ditch we have fallen in and encourage us to just begin to become a functioning part of the body once again, to come out of hiding, to let go of the spotlight and begin to turn it on to somebody else and their needs. Encouraging those people who are going through something hard, who have become, in a sense, defined by their loss. Maybe grief has actually become their identity. To encourage them to allow only one thing to be their identity. Do you know that one thing we want to define us? We only want to be defined, ladies, by our connectedness to Jesus Christ not by our brokenness and our grief or our fabulous successes and accomplishments, but we want to be defined by our connectedness to Jesus Christ. Finally, I want to say that a church that is a safe place for sad people facilitates turning misery into ministry. You know, people gave us a stack of books um, when Hope died, and Kathy told me she got a stack of books too, right? And... I remember in the quietness of that week after Hope's funeral, you know, it gets so quiet after that. And pulled out that stack of books and I was reading this one written by this man who had lost three children. So I kind of thought, well, I can trust what he has to say. And I was reading along and he said at one point, he said, there's only one thing that um, can help the pain. And when I read that line in the book, I like wanted to skip ahead to the answer. I was like I was in the desert and he was telling me where to find the water because honestly at that point I felt so much pain. I was willing to do anything to not have to feel it. I was like, what is it? What is the one thing? So I wrapped reading and he said, serving others. <laughs> I just thought, really? I don't think so. I thought maybe he's just kind of Maybe that's like a preacher's line, you know? And I tell you, I just sat there and I just looked at it and I just thought, really? I don't think so. But I was so desperate. David hadn't gone back to work yet. And so I said, hey, David. And we, we threw all of our yard tools in our car because I, I had a friend from college who had moved into my neighborhood that week before who had become a widow right before Hope was born. And so her husband had been gone a year and she moved into this new house with her three kids. And it's one of those houses that had sat empty for a long time and the landscaping was all overgrown and a mess. And so 
we took our yard tools and we went over to her house and we just started pulling weeds and trimming bushes. And I got to tell you, I just wept as I did it. I just began to weep as I did that. And, but a beautiful thing happened. My tears weren't just for me. I began to think about what it was like for her to move into that house without a husband and leave behind the house she had known him in. And I began to get my eyes off of only my pain and onto someone else's. And I learned that day, and I've learned many days since then, on days when, frankly, I wanted it to be all about me and my pain. And God gave me the opportunity to serve someone else out of my pain. That it's really true. And sometimes, you know, we think, you know what, I can't help anybody because, you know, I can't help in anybody until I feel better myself. But ladies, here's the thing. Helping someone else is the way we begin to feel better. You don't have to wait till you have it all figured out. You don't have to wait till you have it all worked out to begin to serve other people out of your loss. And that's when we get to begin to see that prayer we prayed for God to redeem what he wasn't going to remove and that's where we begin to experience that he is answering that prayer so I wonder do you feel a little more equipped to be a great friend to someone who is going through loss I hope so I figure that there are probably some of you here tonight that you're you are realizing as I say these things that you've had someone who has gone through a loss and you're, you're thinking about the ways that you failed them or the ways you could have done better. And You know, perhaps you might just want to go to that person and say, you know, I just, I didn't know. I, did, I didn't know what to say and I avoided you and I'm sorry. Or, you know, I, I was just trying to fix you and by that I diminished your loss and I'm sorry. That'll be the, a, a fresh and beautiful start, and I bet that person will show you grace. Or maybe you are that hurting person, and if, if you're like me, you know, I, I had a lot of work of forgiving to do for all the people who disappointed me. I'm ashamed to tell you that I kept very close tabs on what people said and did and who avoided me and who said things that seemed to diminish my loss. And I found myself in those months after Hope died becoming a big ball of bitterness toward all the people who had disappeared in the lowest point of my life, especially the people were the ones that I really thought they'd be there. And frankly, I've never met anybody who's gone through a loss like this that didn't have that experience. If that's you... Would you spend some time before you leave tonight? Would you get up when we're done here and go to the prayer room? Would you ask someone to pray with you that the Holy Spirit would begin to do a work in your life to begin to loosen the tight grip you have on that bitterness so that you could begin to forgive those who have hurt you so deeply? You know, forgiveness, I just, I don't know how you can do it without the Holy Spirit doing a work in you to forgive. I know there are some women who would love to meet you in the prayer room and get on their knees with you and pray for the Holy Spirit to give you the power to begin to dislodge the grip that bitterness has on your heart so that you could just be free of it and begin to normalize those relationships with people again. And then there may be some of you, as I've talked about not having an identity of grief, but having an identity of being joined to Christ. As I've talked about what it means to experience the Spirit of God producing fruit in you so that you aren't driven by your own emotions and your own fears and your own sorrows. And that just sounds like a foreign language to you because you feel that you are at the mercy of your emotions. And maybe because of the sorrows in your life, you have never understood how you could ever come close to God because you felt so angry with him for allowing that sorrow into your life. I wonder if tonight you might be willing to get down on your knees with someone and pray and ask God to tear down that wall that you have built between you and him. If you might reach out and take hold of Christ, 
and say, Christ, I need you. I cannot keep trying to work my way through this sorrow and difficulty on my own. I don't have what it takes. I am breaking inside. I need you. I need you. I'm, I'm dead inside, and I need you to make me alive again. Do you know he will do that? He delights to do that. So if that's you, when we're finished tonight, would you go to that prayer room and tell them, tell them I feel dead inside, and I need God to do a miracle in my life to give me new life in Christ. Will you pray with me? And they'll do that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that in the midst of our sorrows, that you really are a safe person to draw close to, that you know what it is to experience deep sorrow. And Lord, as I look at you, I see you throwing your arms open and saying, as you said to the disciples, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your souls. And there are so many of us here, Lord, our souls are so tired. We're so tired of the struggle, so tired of the tears, so tired of searching for something to soothe the pain in our lives and finding nothing. And so, Lord, would you give all of those who feel that way eyes to see you with your arms open wide, inviting us to run to you and that you will give us that promised rest that we can find nowhere else. We've looked for so many other ways to deal with our pain. We've gone to the refrigerator. We've gone to the bottle. We've looked at the television screen and the internet screen, and we've gone on vacation, and we've gone to the mall. We've gotten busy in our work, and none of those things are working. We need you to do a work of healing in our lives that only you can do. And so we welcome you to come by your spirit and do the work of healing, Lord, that only you can do. In your name I pray, amen.